Steve Moore, economist, Godzilla author, Committee to Unleash Prosperity. Steve, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Good morning, guys. Uh, so what say you? Is Fred Smith uh, over the target? Uh, no, he's spot on. By the way, Fred Smith is one of the guys I admire most in America. He's an incredible entrepreneur, one of the great entrepreneurs of all time. And, and he just he has his he has his finger on the economy, and he's he's exactly right about what's happening with what we're doing to our uh, to our economy. Two trillion dollars of debt each year is going to destroy our country. Mm hmm. So um, that being said, I am a regular reader of your Unleash Prosperity newsletter, yep. and I see um, an admonition in your latest edition in the direction of House Republicans. Don't fall prey to a quote unquote budget uh, or government shutdown. Right. Um, yep. So so on the one hand, Fred Smith is right. But on the other hand, just uh, muddle along doing the things that we've been doing low these many years. Well, there's a new development, by the way, and you'll see that in the hotline this morning, which hasn't quite gone on out yet. But uh, what the latest is that what we were recommending is to just take the one percent across the board cut, uh, what's called a continuing resolution, just fund everything at last year's level at one percent less. Now, I think we should be cutting agencies by 10, 20, 25 percent. But given the fact that Republicans have a two seat majority in the House, and they don't control the, the, the Senate and they don't control the White House. They, they really can't have a lot of control over this process. But here's what's interesting. So the Republicans, are, that's become their position. OK, we'll just take the one percent across the board cut. Guess what? The Democrats say, no way. We can't live with a one percent cut in government spending at a time that they're borrowing one point five trillion dollars a year. So I think they've flipped the tables. Part of this is just being smart politically. Uh, I don't think Republicans can win a government shutdown battle. I've lived through 11 of them in my 30 years in Washington, and every single year uh, that happens, uh, the blame is always put on the Republicans. So I think it's much smarter to say to Democrats, okay, we'll go for the 1% tiny little cut in spending, and then let the Democrats go to the American people and say why they'd rather shut down the government and take this teeny weeny little cut in spending. Right. I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but of course, this, you know, surrender today so you can surrender tomorrow. That's been the Republican playbook for, <laughs> for a long time. What, what would yeah. you, okay, Dan, what would you have them do? Well, I mean, I agree with you. I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, Pollyannish about the real politique here and the the slim majority in the House and the the number of big spending Republicans. So I, I would, um, I would lay out the case though. Almost, I mean, I would really like do it in a naked fashion, in terms of the rhetoric, not in terms of my presentation. Um, yeah. The 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 idea is this: Look, this is what we should do, and I would even go so far if I was Mike Johnson to say, look. I've got some people in my caucus that just don't want to rein in runaway spending. I'm not going to name names, but I do. And I, I don't have the votes to do what we should be doing. So this is the same advice I had for Kevin McCarthy back in the day that he didn't take, uh -huh. which is get together with your nucleus and and deliver this like you have to send more actual uh, conservatives. Everybody runs around saying they're fiscal conservative, and the people who say that, you that's a great tell to know that they're not. You have got to make sure that you send us more people who really want to shrink the size and scope and expense of government, because we just don't have the personnel right now. At least that would right. be honest. I'd do it if I had the personnel. I don't have the personnel. You send me the personnel in November, and I'll do it. Here's the problem with that. You are under some kind of grand illusion, Dan, that Republicans want to cut government spending. Well, I'm not. I'm not. Well, that's <laughs> what I'm know. just saying. Well, that's what I'm just I saying. Tell you, but I, I think Mike Johnson. I think, I think Mike Johnson and some some Republicans do. Yeah, some do, but they don't have nearly a majority of even um, even a majority within the Republican caucus of people want to cut spending. And by the way, I love Donald Trump. I'm working for him. Um, I'm yeah, he doesn't want to either. For the campaign, he doesn't yeah. want to cut spending either. I so. Know. Here, I mean, and, and look, my point is this, that we have a really crucial election coming up about the future of our country uh, in November. And I'm obviously a Trump guy. 
I don't agree with Trump on everything, but I think he will he will you know maintain lower taxes. He'll do the drilling. He'll get control of the border. He'll get control of crime. He will uh, get rid of these incredibly um, obtrusive uh, government uh, regulations. He'll do a lot to rebuild this economy. Is he going to massively cut spending? No, he's not. But my point is that the future of our country really depends on the on what happens in this election. And I don't want to get sidetracked in a big debate about who shut down the government and blah, blah, blah. I want to have a debate about these issues, about the border, about what we should do with our tax code, about what, yes, what we should do with our debt. What should we do with, uh, you know, the... Uh, the situation with our energy policy. All these things are critically important to the country right now. Mm-hmm. And I'm worried that Republicans will just get blamed for another shutdown and then we get four more years of Kamala Harris or Joe Biden. Yeah, that would be disastrous. So have you spoken with President Trump after he was handed down, you know, being found liable for $360 million for allegedly defrauding banks and uh, insurers? Yeah, um, <laughs> I did get together with him uh, at, at Mar-a-Lago on uh, the Super Bowl uh, party that he had and chatted with him. But I have not talked to him since this absurd decision comes down. But I've got to tell you, I mean, I've been doing a lot of interviews and things on this. And people are just so outraged by this decision. It, it, it is so unfair. It is We have a two-tier justice system in America today, and it's, it's frightening, actually. Uh, no one can possibly justify this decision. No one was defrauded. No one was defrauded. Nobody lost money here. In fact, the people who bought his properties made money. And here is Donald Trump. And again, love him or hate him. I know people listening to the show have very different opinions on him. But the guy helped build New York. I mean, you know, he was the one who built these incredible air- buildings in decrepit areas. He's the one who, when they couldn't, the government couldn't get the damn s- skating rink built, he stepped in and built it in six months. My point is, when you have people who are major developers who, and builders who come in and, and you know, make a city prosperous, as he and many, many others did, and then to basically say, you can't do business in, in our city anymore, and by the way, we're going to steal $300 million from you, and this is theft. This is the government stealing Donald Trump's money. And, you know, you, you saw what Kevin O'Leary said. The yeah. major investor, he said, I would never do nope. business in New York anymore after this. Who would want to build something in New York when the government could steal your money? But during the appeal process, he, I mean, mostly it's Donald Trump Jr. and Eric Trump. They can still conduct business, right? I don't, I don't you know, I don't know the particulars of what they can and can't do. Uh, but I want to state this again, and I know it's an obvious point, but nobody lost money here. Now, did Donald Trump exaggerate the... Uh, you know, the appraisal of some of these properties. Maybe he did. You know, the Wall Street Journal says, you know, he maybe stretched things. That's what, you know. That, everybody I'm does that. I mean, that. when you but, sell your house yeah. and you know your house is worth 700 yeah. you're going to put it on the market for 750 Exactly. Because <laughs> you know, there might be some <laughs> sucker out there who will take it. I mean, who knows? Exactly. And by the way, I mean, that's a great point you're making. Also, let's say I want to sell my house to you. Yeah. And I say, oh, you know, this is a $750,000 house. And you say, okay, I'm just going to take your word for it. I'm not going to do an appraisal of what the property right. is worth. Right, I mean, right. who does that? You just... So sad, too bad. So um, yesterday's uh, little Fox News town hall that Trump had in South Carolina with uh, Laura Ingram presiding, uh, you know, the question came up, as you might expect, a question that does not come up when Nikki Haley does a town hall, which is who do you think will be your running mate? Um, the uh you know, she ran through a list of the usual suspects, uh, at least that have been mentioned, you know, on the short list. And Trump sort of gave a general acknowledgement that they're all fine people. Do you have any um, perspective on his selection, uh, the importance of it, who you think would be the best fit for him, regardless of where he might be at the moment? Well, before I answer that question, uh, because we're doing a poll of conservative major conservative voices, and I have two of them on the phone right now. So I would like to get your answer to that question, and then I'll answer it. So, uh, Amy, uh, ladies first, if you were Donald Trump, who would you take (laughs) as your VP nominee? Well, I had my heart set on Nikki Haley, but clearly that ship has sailed. (laughs) Yeah, I don't think that ain't happening. But actually, if you think she's the right one, yeah, she can be your choice. I so. do. I mean, I think she would help with, you know, undecided suburban women voters. Okay. All right. I'm going to put you down with Nikki Haley. And there are many others who took that. Okay, Dan. 
Um, Javier Mille. Is he available? <laughs> um, so, Dan Proc. I love it. Dan... I don't, but wait a minute. He's not an American citizen, is he? Yeah. No. That doesn't uh, matter anymore. Uh, he, yeah, right. He, if he, he can get, come here legally get... or illegally. Yeah. We'll let so him we'll, vote. We'll he smuggle okay. him in. Who is someone, Dan? <laughs> Who, by the way, this guy, for, so people know, he's the president of Argentina, and he took over, and they had a debt that was like double their GDP, and he balanced the budget in one month. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and he takes plane. He doesn't take a, like Air Force, their equivalent of Air Force One. He flies with the people when he goes. Yeah, yeah. And he's, he's, cause he's all right, cutting, but Dan, I want a serious, agencies. I want a serious yeah. answer from you. Who who's eligible that you would take if you were Trump? Tim Scott. Tim Scott. Okay. Now my choice would be, I really like um, Kim Reynolds, the governor of Iowa. I think yes. she's awesome. Uh, I, I also like think taking someone, someone like uh, someone who's really steady and smart, and not necessarily has a lot of. Uh, you know, uh, pizzazz, but I really like the, um, uh, like I was saying, the Secretary of State for uh, uh, um, for Biden. I mean, for uh, for Trump. Um, Pompeo. You know uh, Pompeo, because the guy's so super wicked smart. He's a total professional, and I just would relish the day to see Mike Pompeo debate Kamala Harris. But, <laughs> oh, that would. I mean, <laughs> anybody who debates her, please come on. Yeah. <laughs> like a turkey shoot, Stephen. So you, oh, you, by the way, guys, I have to tell Pompeo, you, I gave really? a speech uh, on Saturday night in Barrington, Illinois, uh, yeah. to their Reagan dinner, and there were about 150 to 200 people there. They all listened to the Dan and Amy show. But I've got to tell you, Amy, you know, uh, I don't know. The Republicans have like Stockholm syndrome or something in, in Illinois. <laughs> There's just they feel like there's nothing they can do against this. They, I didn't even realize the Democrats in the legislature in Springfield, they have a veto-proof majority. Yeah. Yes. Yes, a, a very <laughs> comfortable supermajority. They have had for a long time because there is no opposition party. There's just a handful of sensible people milling about it uh, at Reagan and Lincoln Day dinners in places like Barrington, but that's it. There's no, there's no yeah, signs of life I, here. The only point is, you know, that these were wonderful people and I had a great time. And, yes, but, exactly. You know, it just, they all are so, like, forlorn that there's nothing we can do. We're up against the, <laughs> this wall of Democrats. And, and when I grew up in Illinois, Illinois was a purple state. Now it is one of the bluest states in the country. We did vote yes. for Reagan, though, back in the 80s. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's right. That's yeah. right. It yeah, was a it's, good year. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's been a, a minute. Yeah. It's been a minute. Um, yeah, well, a lot of uh, self-inflicted wounds there. We'll have to uh, do a, a uh, battle plan for the resurgence of a Republican Party in Illinois some other time because that's a yeah, do you think, Dan, extended that, do you think conversation. Dan, that Trump could win Illinois? <laughs> uh, no. Not, not, there, yeah. Not a chance in H-E-double-L no, hockey. Mean, he, he'd have a, well, he'd have a better, yeah, I, I'm not even going to get into it. All right, Steve Moore, economist, and, uh, of course, Godzilla author, Unleash, comedian Unleash Prosperity as well. Sign up for his uh, Unleash Prosperity hotline newsletter if you haven't already. Steve, thanks as always. Appreciate it. All right, you guys, you guys are very popular in Barrington. Thank you. Appreciate it. We appreciate <laughs> you. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. This is the morning show. More Chicago radio listeners are choosing. This is Chicago's morning answer on AM560. The answer. This is Albert Moeller for townhall.com. No man, no problem. That's the way Joe Stalin put it. Totalitarian regimes and dictators know how to deal with problems, they disappear.